gather. And then one other thing before we get into our study, I was reading today in the Orange County Register something in the, in, uh, the opinion section, and I thought it was interesting enough to read to you. This came out of the Orange County Register today, and I thought it was interesting. Even as I was reading it, I was thinking about how, how things have changed over the years and all, and uh, I think you may, if you haven't read, if you don't get the Orange County Register, if you haven't read this, you might find this interesting, but this is uh, basically what I read today. At exactly 9 p.m. on Christmas Eve, 1906, wireless operators aboard U.S. Navy vessels and United Fruit Company ships witnessed a miracle. Accustomed only to hearing transmissions of short and long pulses representing the dots and dashes of Morse code, wireless operators on that historic night before Christmas actually heard voice and music over the airwaves. That first ever radio broadcast was a product of the pioneering work of Reginald Fessenden. Fessenden was the first to transmit audio by electromagnetic waves. He did so by developing a transmitter that employed amplified modulation, more commonly known today as AM. So it was on that Christmas Eve, at the dawn of what would come to be known as the American Century, that Mr. Fessenden was in Brant Rock, Massachusetts transmission shack, which boasted a 420-foot top-loaded umbrella antenna and which sent his broadcast to radio-enabled ships in the Central and South Atlantic Ocean. It began with the message CQ, CQ, CQ in Morse code, which was a general call to all the ships or ground stations in range. Then came a Christmas program introduced by Mr. Fessenden, who was the son of an Anglican minister. It began with a recording of a soloist singing Handel's Largo, played on, Edis on an Edison phonograph. Readings were to follow by Mr. Fessenden's assistant, his wife, Helen, and his secretary, but all three were overcome by mic fright. So Mr. Fessenden made a cameo, violin in hand, treating listeners to his cover of the Christmas favorite, O Holy Night. Then the first radio broadcast in history concluded with the prayerful words from the book of Luke that resonate as much in our troubled times today as they did nearly 110 Christmas Eves ago, on earth, peace, goodwill to men. And I was thinking about that today, how that times have changed, haven't they? The first radio broadcast was to celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ, and scripture reading and worship took place. I, I really feel that we Christians, I don't know how to say this in a proper way, but we need to wake up. We need to wake up. We've given up a lot of ground to the enemy, but we need to wake up. Because here we are celebrating the birth of Jesus Christ. And isn't that something we ought to be celebrating? The birth of our Lord and Savior. And that's what we're going to look to today at in, or tonight at in chapter 1 here in verses 18 through 25 of the book of Matthew. Beginning at verse 18. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. After his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not wanting to make her a public example, was minded to put her away secretly. But while he thought about these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take to you Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. She will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated, God with us. Then Joseph, being aroused from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord commanded him and took to him his wife and did not know her till she had brought forth her firstborn son and he called his name Jesus. The celebration of Christmas is traditionally regarded as a holiday and it's a holiday that is regarded as one that is joyful. For many Christmas is about family, it's about friends, it's gifts, it's food, it's celebration. 
It may even also involve attending church services and singing worship hymns. And all of these things have value. I appreciate the many years that I have celebrated this holiday. But what I want to do tonight in our Christmas Eve service is I want to concentrate on the scriptural meaning of Christmas. I want to spend time with you sharing the heart of the Christmas message. And we can begin by considering what Matthew is telling his readers about the birth of Jesus Christ. He makes it clear here in this passage that Jesus' conception was miraculous in that his mother was a virgin. Her child was conceived by the intervention of the Holy Spirit. Her child is Emmanuel, which means God with us, quoting Isaiah 7:14. And her child was to be named Jesus. The name Jesus means Jehovah is salvation. And the reason he will be named Jesus is because he will save his people from their sins. Now these things alone make the Christian faith stand out from all other so-called religious faiths. We celebrate the birth of the Son of God who is the Savior, and he is the Savior of all who believe. When the Apostle Paul was writing to young Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 10, he said this, he said, for to this end we both labor and suffer reproach because we trust in the living God who is the Savior of all men, especially of those who believe. He is the potential Savior of any who would come to him, the actual Savior of the one who receives him. You know, the reason I decided to take this tack today and share with you a little bit about the scriptural reasons that we believe in Christ and all is because today... We, uh, we have many voices who are basically saying that all religions, by and large, are worshiping the same God, when in fact that's not true. This fact needs to re be remembered today because I believe that religious people are obscuring what the Bible actually has to say. As unpopular as it is, Allow me to lay a foundation concerning Jesus Christ and his birth. You see, when you read the Gospel of John, you immediately notice how John began his Gospel. In John chapter 1, verse 1, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and he says, and the Word was God. In verse 14 of the same chapter, the Word became flesh, dwelt amongst us. We beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten Son of God, full of grace and truth. The Word became flesh. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. And the Word became flesh. So Christmas is a celebration of what we call the incarnation. Incarnation is taken from the Latin word, which is also where the Spanish language comes from, the derivative incarne, in flesh. The incarnation speaks about God taken upon himself, human flesh. And Matthew is saying that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And John has made it clear that Jesus Christ is God himself in the flesh. So these revelations distinguish the Christian faith from the Jewish faith as well as the Muslim faith. Because neither recognize Jesus Christ as God in the flesh. And without the conviction of the Holy Spirit, neither Jew nor Muslim will recognize Christ for what he is. Recently, some of you perhaps saw the same photograph that I saw. It was a picture of a young woman holding a sign. And the sign read, I am a Christian, and I love the Quran. So if you're a Christian and you love the Quran, what does the Quran say about Jesus that should cause me as a Christian to love it? Why would I as a Christian say that I love the Quran? I need to know what it has to say. What does it say about the Lord Jesus Christ? Because today we have people saying that the, the God of, of Islam and the God of, of the Christian is the same God. But if, the, it, if it is the same God, then the Quran would say the same thing that the Bible says about Jesus Christ. The Bible says in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. What does the Quran say? Well, it says that Jesus is not the Son of God. It reads, O people of the scripture, do not exaggerate in your religion, nor utter aught concerning Allah save the truth. The Messiah, Jesus, son of Mary, was only a messenger of Allah, and his word which he conveyed unto Mary and a spirit from him. 
So believe in Allah and his messengers, and say not three. Cease, it is better for you. Allah is only one Allah. Far, far is it removed from his transcendent majesty that he should have a son. His is all that is in the heavens and all that is in the earth, and Allah is sufficient as defender. It says Jesus was not crucified. Because of their saying, we slew the Messiah, Jesus, son of Mary, Allah's messenger, they slew him not, nor crucified him, but it appeared so unto them. And lo, those who disagree concerning it are in doubt thereof. They have no knowledge thereof, save pursuit of a conjecture. They slew him not for certain. It reads, those who believe in the incarnation are unbelievers. They have certainly disbelieved to say that Allah is Christ, the son of Mary. It says those who believe that Jesus is God's son are accursed. Christians call Christ the son of Allah. That is, that is a saying from their mouth. In this they but imitate what the unbelievers of old used to say. Allah's curse be on them. How, can, how they are deluded away from the truth. Someone said it is strange for someone who professes to be a Christian who presumably believes that Jesus is the son of God, the second person of the Trinity, who was crucified and rose from the dead for the salvation of the human race to profess love for a book that denies all that and says that those who believe it are accursed, vile beings who should be waged war against until they submit to the dominance of a group that believes differently. A Christian can, a Christian can and should say, I'm a Christian, I love Muslims. But we need to remember that love for people is not the same as a love for the book a book that rejects Jesus Christ. Christmas is a commemoration of God giving to us his son Jesus, God in the flesh. As unpopular, as unpopular as this message is for some today, it is the message of Christmas. We have substituted mythologies and parties and gifts and so many things. And I come with a sense of sorrow in my heart by having to even say to us as a church that we also need to wake up to what's taking place. Jesus Christ is the savior of the world. Jesus Christ is God in the flesh. And there is no other way to God except through Jesus Christ. Let us not forget that. As we look at this passage, we, we see a young man who is engaged to be married, but he has found that his bride-to-be is pregnant. Matthew speaks of Joseph as being, in verse 19, a just man. He's a righteous man, and his espoused wife, Mary, has been found with child. And now he has to make a decision. Joseph is now considering quietly what he must do, and he's considering breaking his marriage agreement. But as he does so, the Bible here tells us that the angel spoke to him. In Matthew 1, verse 20, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take to you Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. Now, Matthew makes it very clear that this miraculous event is actually foretold in the Old Testament. In verse 23 of Matthew 1, he says, uh, behold, the virgin shall be with child, bear a son. They shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. Emmanuel, God takes upon himself human flesh and he is dwelling with us. He's dwelling amongst us and with us. And why would the Lord do that? Why would God take upon himself human flesh? Somebody said humanity is lost, fallen. We are separated from God because of our sin. And our only hope of forgiveness was for someone completely innocent of any wrongdoing to take all the punishment for our crimes. Such a perfect life and a perfect love were impossible for any human to achieve. So God himself did it for us. He sent his son from eternity into mortality, from glory into flesh, and from a throne to a manger. Ultimate hope was born in ultimate humility. This is the immense love that God has for us. And this love is revealed to us in an almost unbelievable and incredible way. God's Son gave up the splendor of heaven to dwell with us. 
And that reveals to us his great love for us. In 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9, you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that you through his poverty might become rich. God came into the world, the world he created, to rescue those who have rejected him. And as Christians, we realize that the meaning of Christmas is wrapped up in this one word. The meaning of Christmas is Emmanuel. Now this season is a hectic season. And because it has become so, it's important for us to take a moment to regain our focus. The fact is, Christmas is the time of the year for us to remember something, to remember the love that God has for us. It's like what John said in 1 John chapter 4, verses 9 and 10, where he said, In this was manifested the love of God toward us, because that God sent his only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through him. Herein is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to, the, to be the propitiation for our sins. You see, the central purpose of Christmas is to celebrate God demonstrating his love to us. It's a time that we rejoice in the love of God. It's a time that we rejoice because God sent his son for us. If we look at the condition of the world, our nation, our state, the cities, or even our families, we can lose hope. We may very well be overcome with sorrow, even a sense of hopelessness and helplessness. You see, when Jesus Christ is absent from Christmas, Christmas has no meaning. When you look in the uh, Gospel of Luke and you look at uh, chapter 2, verses 9 through 14, and that portion of Scripture records how that, that God gave what we would call today a, a heavenly birth announcement. And he did that to shepherds who were in a field. And when you read Luke and you see chapter 2, it says in verse 10 that the angel said to these shepherds, I bring to you good news, good news, of great joy. The birth of Jesus, the Savior of the world, is intended to bring great joy. And that's because God is with his people. That is because God is delivering them from the slavery that they live in, the slavery to their sin. Paul in 1 Timothy 1.15 said, here's a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. Christmas has the message, the message of God's presence with us, the message of God loving us, the message of God forgiving us of our sin. And that's the heart of Christmas. And because a Savior being born is so important, Satan has worked overtime to obscure and diminish that message. Today we simply look at the Christmas story as a myth. We even see it as a child's story. Many have taken the heart out of the story of the birth of Christ and in doing so have left it empty of its power to save. When my children were small growing up, Christmas Eve was the night that we would gather together we did this all of their lives until they moved out, until they got married. And we would gather together on Christmas Eve, and when they were small, we would give each one of them one present to open. And, oh, man, they were so, um, you know, they, they, they wanted to tear into those presents so bad. It's because their mama did, and they wanted to, too. They wanted to tear open those presents, but I would have them hold on to the present and they would be all excited and, and I'd say, but before we take a moment to open the presents, we're gonna open the word. And I would open the gospel and I would read to them out of Luke and I would share with them. And I would say this, this is the kind of thing I would say to my children, I would say, Christmas is not about presents. Christmas is about Jesus. Christmas is not you receiving a present. Christmas is you receiving him in your life. Amen. And as we have these presents, it's a, it's, it's a blessing that God provides for you. And I don't want you not to be happy that you're receiving when you should. It's a gift to you. But the greatest gift that you'll ever receive is the gift of eternal life. And here's something for you that many people today seem to be disagreeing with. I would say to them, 
you know, Santa Claus doesn't exist. Oh, no, don't tell my kid that. He believes in him. Well, here's the thing. When my kids grew up, they never were confused about whether or not there is a Savior. And they were taught that Jesus Christ and his birth, that's a fact. But there are myths and traditions around a man named Santa Claus or Kris Kringle or St. Nicholas or whatever you want. There are mythologies re, re, you know, revolving around him. And I would say, you know, some of your friends, um, you know, their parents tell them there's a Santa Claus. I'd say, you know, don't blow it for them, but there isn't one. I taught them the same thing around Easter. And I'd say, you know, the Easter bunny and Easter eggs, you know, because we didn't hunt for Easter eggs in our house and we didn't talk about the Easter bunny. They, they heard that other places. They didn't hear it with us. And I would tell them, you need to keep the resurrection the center of your understanding about Easter. It has nothing to do with bunnies. It has nothing to do with baskets. It has nothing to do with bonnets. It has everything to do with Jesus Christ being raised from the dead. And I would teach them that. And one day my son Joseph had an assignment. I think it was eight years old and he was in class and the assignment was to draw something about Easter and he drew something about Easter. I've never forgotten. He was around eight years old. He's now 34, so it was a long time ago. But he drew a picture of the empty tomb. He has a picture of the tomb. It, had an, it was open. It had a stone in front of it. And it had a picture of an Easter bunny bowing before the empty tomb. <laughs> because that's what I taught him. Every knee shall bow, including the Easter bunny. <laughs> Parents, make sure your children know who Jesus Christ is. Make sure you teach them the truth of who Jesus Christ is. Christ is the Son of God, second person of the most holy trinity. He took upon himself human flesh. He was born in order that he might die. He is the Savior of the world. And we celebrate Christmas because God gave the greatest gift to us. He gave us his Son. We need to remember that. He loved us. One of the things about love uh, is, is in order to understand it, it needs to be demonstrated and, and it needs to be received. You see, God's love is openly declared. It was manifested. It was expressed visibly. The Bible tells us, I just read this in 1 John 4, verse, uh, verse 10, in this, the love of God was manifested because, he says, God sent his son. Why did he send his son? Well, Math Matthew in chapter 1, verse 21 here uh, says that she's going to give birth to a son. You will give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. So the Bible says clearly, God sent his son that he might provide salvation for sinful man. Throughout the Bible, man is revealed to be separated from God. And what separates us from God is our sin. Isaiah tells us in chapter 59, verses 1 and 2, Behold, the hand of the Lord is not shortened that it cannot save, nor his ear heavy that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated you from your God. Your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. Sin makes separation. There's none righteous, the Bible says. No, not one. All have sinned, fall short of the glory of God. The wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through his son, Jesus Christ. It's appointed unto men to die once, the Bible says. And after this, the judgment. But God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. If you hear my word and believe in him who sent me, you will have eternal life. And you have passed from death into life. And so what we have in Jesus Christ is life. The Bible tells us very clearly that what we deserve because we have violated God's standards, we have sinned. What we deserve is his judgment. But God gave us a way through grace. And through grace, we have an ability to not be judged. God demonstrated his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That's the purpose in God sending his son. He came to save us by living a perfect life and then yielding it up for us. In Luke 19, verse 10, we read, the son of man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. 
Somebody says, I love God. But the Bible says, no, he loved you. He loved you first. And he demonstrated what love is when he gave his son. Again, 1 John 4, 10 says, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and he sent his son. We didn't love him first. The opposite is true. He loved us first. And loving God occurs when we receive his love for us. It's a response of gratitude. I've been telling myself you shouldn't speak personally, give personal illustrations because it probably dilutes the message. But I'm going to give you a personal illustration anyway. Because I learn things and I put them into practice and then I try and say, this is how I learned it. And, and you know, it's, it's never one of those things where I'm trying to do anything other than that. When my mom and I, when I was a little boy, my mom, when she would speak to me, uh, would always use illustrations, always. That's how we conversed. When my mom wanted to teach me something, she would give me an illustration. And that's how I learned to communicate, and that's how I teach. I, I, I teach this way because my mom spoke to me this way. So she'd say, David, it's like this, or David, it's like that. And, and then she'd illustrate. And so that's what I do. And, and so one of the things to try and bring this, this lofty concept of God loving and you responding. I, I look at human relationships because very often they mirror what the Lord's relationship with me is. And, and I can tell you this, many people know in this fellowship, if you're a visitor, then this may be the first time you've ever heard this. Um, those who are part of this church, you already know this, but I'll say it this way. Everybody who knows me knows that I'm in love with a woman by the name of Marie. Everybody knows that because I, I mention her every time I preach and I don't mean to, I just do. Well, that's really not true. She pays me to, but that's another, that's, that's entirely different. But why, why do I love my wife the way that I do? I want to make this practical and this is how I do it. Because I'm thankful. I am thankful that this woman loves me. I'm thankful that she loves me. With all these warts, with all these imperfections. But she loves me. I, don't un I, I haven't understood it yet. We've been together over 40 years. I still don't understand it. How? How come? But you know what that's made me do? It's made me love her with everything in me. Everything I'm supposed to give to a woman, I give to that woman. Why? I'm thankful. I'm grateful. I'm loved. And that's why out of the abundance of my heart, I will speak and I will say these things. It's not because I'm forced to. It's not because, oh, I've got some weird um, self-esteem issues. It's, I'm grateful. And when you are loved, you are set free to be who God intended you to be. When I began to realize how God loves me, I responded to his love. I, I, I am not one of these, these believers, and, and I hope none of us are, but I'm not one of these believers who is going to say, I'll show you how much I love you. I'll prove to you how much I love you. I'm not that way with God. We have a man by the name of the Apostle Peter. The Apostle Peter tells the Lord Jesus Christ, if everybody denies you, I never will. I will die for you. And what he's basically saying is, I really love you. Now, in the Old Testament, the Bible says, love the Lord thy God with everything within you. And so the Apostle Peter is an individual who's saying, I love you with everything within me. That's the great commandment. And I love you, and I would never betray you, and I will even die for you. And yet, you have somebody else by the name of John who keeps on saying in the Gospel of John that he's the one whom Jesus loved. And as I look at those two different men, you have one boasting about the immensity of their love. I will do anything for you. I will die for you. And when Jesus was taken there in the Garden of Gethsemane, it's the Apostle Peter who pulls out a sword and tries to take Malchus's head off. I will die for you, and I'll die in combat for you. 
But when it all came down to it, and Jesus is on a cross, and some women are around him, including his mother, where was the apostle Peter? Where were the other men? Peter was boasting, I will leave and die for you. I love you more than the rest of these people. I'll prove it by dying for you. But he wasn't there. The one who said, I love you with all of my heart was not at the cross. But the one who said, I am loved by you, he was. I don't want to boast and become one who says, oh, I love, no, no. It's not that I loved him. It's that he loves me. And he gave his life for me. And that makes me want to serve him the rest of my life. Because he loves me. He is the savior of the world. Christmas is not about what you can do for God. It's about what God has done for you. He gave you his son. And we give gifts to our children that will perish with the using, but my heavenly Father gives them life and that eternal. So what's the most precious gift to receive on Christmas? Eternal life. Life that is from God himself. God sent his son, and we receive that gift. God would have us receive that gift. The Bible tells us in John 1, 11 and 12, he came to his own, his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to those who believe on his name. So Christmas reminds us that we need a Savior. Christmas reminds us that God has provided salvation through Jesus Christ. God offers forgiveness, and he offers life, and he does so freely. We, we simply humbly repent and in faith receive what Christ offers us. And then he restores us. Then he places his spirit within us. And then, like Paul said, then we become new creations. Old things passed away. Behold, all things become new. The Bible tells us with the heart one believes to righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. And when the Holy Spirit spoke to my heart as he spoke to yours and said, it's time to get right with me, that's when I said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I received this gift of life that you gave to me through Jesus Christ the one who was born, the Savior of the world. So as we celebrate Christmas, it isn't a myth. It isn't a children's story. It is the gospel. It is truth. God took upon himself human flesh. He dwelt amongst us, and his glory was beheld. The glory is of the only begotten Son of God. Christmas is not a story. It's a fact, and we celebrate the reality of Jesus.